Our, our gospel reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 to 56. This reading will serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. Immediately, please stand for the reading of the gospel. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, People recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Your feelings are valid. Have you heard that message before? Your feelings are valid. Understood improperly, someone might hear this as an excuse to have whatever reaction they want to any situation, no matter how rude or hurtful or immature it is, because that's what they felt like doing. Or someone might hear this and decide that what they feel is their truth. That me feeling it's Sunday, mm -mm, I feel it's Wednesday, so it's Wednesday. That what I feel about someone, that I can make these judgmental conclusions about who they are, what their intentions are, because that's what I feel they are or their intentions were. That's understood improperly, right? But the message, your feelings are valid, when understood properly, can be this. That you don't need to shut down when you hear the feelings your body tells you. You don't need to suppress your emotions and bury them deep down and ignore them. Because knowing and understanding our feelings can be beneficial to us. So, to put that into practice, when someone comes to you and they're sad, you don't just say, cheer up, right? When someone comes to you and they're angry and upset, you don't just say, calm down. When someone comes to you and they're scared, they're anxious, they're terrified, you don't just say to them, have courage, don't be afraid. Right? Right? Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. What's he doing? 
Doesn't Jesus know that you can't just walk up to someone, a group of people petrified in fear, and say, don't be afraid? That's callous. That's insensitive. And more than that, it's not helpful to walk up to someone and say, stop feeling the way you're feeling. It's not how we function as humans, right? Besides, the disciples, they had a rational reason to be afraid, right? Even though they're experienced fishermen, they're in the middle of a lake over 100 feet deep. It's the middle of the night. There's big waves, strong wind. They've been at this for hours rowing, so they're probably a little bit tired, for sure, and more likely, they're completely exhausted. Their rowing is getting them absolutely nowhere. So they had a good reason to be afraid, didn't they? Fear can be our body's way of telling us something's not right. When you're standing at the top of a really tall building, or when you're looking over the edge of a cliff, your mind screams to you, careful. If you're hiking and you come across a bear or a copperhead, your mind is screaming at you, danger. To some degree, fear tells us that we're not in control, that we're powerless. That's a very real feeling. Sometimes we experience real feelings of fear collectively, as a group. If a, if a grandparent is going into the operating room, if news comes that a cousin was involved in a car accident, we experience real feelings of fear together. We also experience real feelings of fear in our own personal, private ways. Rejection, humiliation, decision-making. Maybe when it's time for a big decision to be made at work and all the responsibility rests on you, how do you not second-guess yourself that you're making the right decision? Or maybe it's more personal than that. Maybe it's about being open with someone, letting your, your guard down, your walls down, being you, no filter, and what if they don't like me? What if I don't measure up to their expectations? What if they don't think I'm worth loving? Rational fears can permeate our lives. But we don't just feel rational fears, do we? We also have irrational fears. The disciples, they saw a figure walking to them on the water, and instead of thinking that it could be their all-powerful Lord, who just turned five loaves of bread and two fish into a meal for 10,000 people, they make a different conclusion. Their conclusion instead must be a ghost. Must be a ghost. A ghost. What irrational fears do we have? Maybe it's as simple as being afraid of the dark or the, the monsters under your bed. Maybe it's as deep as fearing that you're unlovable to God. Maybe it's the overthinking your mind does that sends you spiraling in anxiety. Fill in the blank. We all have irrational fears. And our fear has a way of messing with reality. And the world, it has nothing to say to comfort our fears with lasting effectiveness. It's okay. Everything is going to be all right. Tomorrow will be a better day. Or maybe something more profound. 
It's always darkest before the dawn. Maybe. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Maybe it won't. There's nothing authoritative or powerful in even the most clever comfort the world has to offer us. Do Jesus' words fall into the same category? Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Is that just another empty saying? Another baseless hope? Something that sounds nice, but doesn't really carry anything with it? Not at all. Jesus understood the real feelings his disciples were feeling in that boat. And he understands and knows the real feelings that each of his people face in life. And his message remains. Have courage. Don't be afraid. So why isn't this just an empty pat on the back to the disciples? Because Jesus shares where the source of your courage will come from. Because he is, he is, always has been, always will be. And because Jesus controls everything from his heart of love. His heart of love that rejoiced to take away through Jesus the greatest fear we could have. an eternal separation and powerlessness before God. And in place of that fear, he substituted faith. Faith and confidence in our salvation won by Jesus' resurrection. So do Jesus' words fall into the same category of that as the world? Hear Jesus' words from John chapter 14. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. These words don't come from some abstract, ethereal God. No, the book of Hebrews shares this. We do not have We do not have a high priest. Jesus is who the author is talking about. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. This God we have, Jesus, he's not naive about what we experience in our minds and hearts. So how can he empathize with our struggles? Well, one, he's all-knowing. Two, he experienced what it's like to be human. After Jesus speaks to his disciples, he gets in the boat with them. He's with them in their troubles, in their fears, And Jesus really did get in the boat with his disciples. And he also got into the boat with all of humanity. God made our human struggle his when he chose to be born as as a baby in an imperfect world to live and experience hunger and tiredness and danger. He lived this struggle sinlessly without ever a doubt or a worry or skepticism in his heavenly Father's perfect plan. He died this struggle. And when we gather together on a Sunday morning, we celebrate his victory over this struggle. That Jesus was more powerful than even death. That when death and Jesus met, It was death that was changed forever. Not just for Jesus, 
but for each one of us. That's the power of our God. He is more powerful. He is powerful enough to change the reality of death. He's powerful enough to change the storm systems over a lake in Israel. And he's a God powerful enough to change the real feelings and experiences of his people. This isn't the first time that the Bible speaks to real people and tells them to have courage, to not be afraid. Here's a couple examples. And to note this, when the Bible says, don't be afraid, it's not encouraging us to test God by doing something stupidly dangerous and seeing if he'll save us. It's telling us to trust God. And there's two things to note in these examples. There's two things to note in these examples. The first thing is that when God gives this command to not be afraid, the people are in a real dangerous situation. Like they have a rational reason to be afraid where they're at. And the second is that when God tells them not to be afraid, he gives them this command before, before they actually get delivered from the situation they're in. Which means, what's he telling them? Trust me, even when it doesn't look like it's worth it. God controls everything in the lives, our lives, from a heart of love. Our first example Moses has just led the Israelites out of Egypt, right? So we're after the ten plagues. The Israelites make their exodus. They've come to the Red Sea. Sea in front of them doesn't look like they're making it across, right? No chance. They look back and they see the whole Egyptian army coming after them with not nice intentions. And then God says this to Moses. God says this to Moses to tell to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. What happens next? God miraculously parts the Red Sea. The Israelite um, nation comes through on dry land. And when the Egyptian army comes to follow, the waters come back in. They never see the Egyptians again. Another example, a man named Jairus comes to Jesus and tells him that his daughter is deathly sick at home, begs Jesus to come with him, to come to his house and to heal his daughter. Jesus takes his time uh, in his wisdom. He heals another lady. And then Jairus' friends come and they say, don't bother bringing Jesus. Your daughter's already passed away. the fear and dread that man, Jairus, must have felt to begin to picture a life without his little girl. Overhearing what the friends said to Jairus, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. What happens next? Jesus goes to the house of Jairus and he raises his daughter from the dead. One more example. The Lord tells Ezekiel, one of his prophets, to preach his word to a people that aren't going to like him, that aren't going to listen to him, and aren't really going to make his life very happy. What's the message the Lord tells to Ezekiel? And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified that, by them, although they are a rebellious people. Don't be afraid. Share my promise with them. That's what the Lord says to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. 
Now it's your turn. What's your fear? What's your situation where fear is the rational response? Where it makes sense to be afraid? These feelings are real. At the same time, have courage. Don't be afraid. Why? Because your situations will shift and your fears will shuffle around. So why? Because God does not depend on your situations. And because God's promises transcend whatever your situation is. The word of God creates new realities. It did when our world was formed at God's command. It did when he created in you a new heart that before wanted nothing to do with God, but now believes in him. And the word of God creates a new reality in your life when he protects you from the wind and the waves that splinter your boat called life. So now in life, we get to act like Jesus because his reality creating courage, it leads us to latch on to his promise, not just of perfect control in our lives, but of perfect self-sacrificial love for us. So now, we get the opportunity for this meaningful ministry to be in the boat with others, to be in the boat with your friends and your families, your at-home families and your church family, to listen to each other's fears, to empathize with each other's weakness, to pray with each other, to encourage one another. This is meaningful ministry. And when you get the opportunity for this meaningful ministry, don't give to each other like the world gives. Empty sayings and baseless hopes. Give them this. That our God is powerful. That his actions had the power to do everything to save us that his words have the power to help us believe this, to make us believe this, to make this reality ours in him. Remember what Elisha prayed in our first reading when there's, the army is all around him and his servant? He said, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes to see that the one who is with us, he's greater than everyone who's against us. Don't be afraid. Have courage. And you know what's probably true? We might struggle with this for the rest of our lives. We might struggle with fear and doubt until the day we die. Every Sunday in this sermon series, there's a fear attached. Fear of rejection, fear of the authority that you have as God's servant, fear of what happens when you give your heart of compassion to each other, fear of not having enough. I pray that in this sermon series, you've come to know how God meaningfully ministers to us in our lives and how we have the privilege of sharing in the most meaningful ministry there is to give this hope and confidence to everyone we know. This is what Paul gave to Timothy in that second reading, that even if it seems like no one is with us, that everyone has left us, that we're all alone, our God is with us. Have courage. 
Don't be afraid. Friends, the Lord is with you. Amen.